Thank you, everybody, for coming. When you first hear the words terrorist, what image comes to mind? Is it Osama bin Laden, 9-11 hijackers, or just any Arab-looking, long-bearded, tall man who wanted to, wanted to destroy the American way of life? Or what about when you hear the phrase Allah Akbar? Does it remind you of something a terrorist might say? Or the peaceful phrase that 1.9 billion people around the world use to praise God? You see, across public media, Arabs and Muslims are constantly depicted as evil terrorists who have it out for Americans. I was born and raised as a Muslim here in the United States. And as a child, I never realized the dangers of being a Muslim here until my eighth grade year of middle school. That's where I was hit, called a terrorist, told the government was coming after me, got to a physical altercation, and I was the one who got suspended. But as time went on, I joined the Army National Guard, and I enrolled in the Army Cadet Corps at Georgia Military College. And during my enrollment in a world civilization class, I remember entering a chapter of Islam, and my professor explaining his definition of jihad. His definition was that jihad is sacrificing yourself in the name of Allah. And the, the example he gave was strapping a bomb onto yourself and blowing up a bus. That was his example he gave in front of his own class. Now, and if this were true, there would not be any Muslims alive today. And I'll never forget his next statement. He said, not all Muslims are bad, though. Some choose not to use their jihad. He pointed at me. He said, like Mr. El-Shami over here. He won't use his jihad on us. We would have known by now. That was his statement. And although that did hurt, what really hurt the most was the fact that he was continuously teaching this information to his classes before and after me. It is a repetition of the same information he's teaching that is providing and producing these stereotypes. That repetition is the same repetition that scares me about films. Dr. Jack Shaheen was a professor of mass communication at Southern Illinois University. He's universally known because of his book, because of his award-winning book, The TV Era. And he reviewed over 900 films that represent an Arab or Muslim character. And in his four years of reviewing films, he found that less than 5%, 5% of all films portray Muslims and, Amer and Muslims and Arabs in a positive light. 5%. And one of the movies he reviewed was The Siege. And as a part of my uh, capstone, I, uh, I conducted a film analysis of The Siege that was directed by Edward Zwick. It starred Denzel Washington and Bruce Willis. And so the film is about a terrorist attack that happened in Brooklyn. It was conducted by Palestinian men, right? And following the attacks, martial law is then um, announced by the president and New York is now under martial law. So what martial law is? Martial law is the suspension of civil authority and the imposition of military authority. So when a country is under martial law, the military acts as a, legis acts as a legislator. They're in control of the police and the courts. So staying with the movie, the military then rounds up all the Arabs and Muslims in the city and places them in detention camps. And I wanted to share with you a scene. I wanted to share with you a scene that resonates with me the most and shows how many Muslim Americans feel today. like 
to be in uniform, serving your country, wearing that flag over my shoulder, and still not being treated as an American. You see, when these movies constantly depict people the same way, it sticks. And Dr. Jack Shaheen concluded that since 1896, filmmakers have collectively indicated all Arabs and Muslims as public enemy number one. Since 1896. Since 1896 until now, Arabs and Muslims are represented so often as evil to the point where it dehumanizes Muslims. At the end of a different movie, Rules of Engagement, it shows United States Marines opening fire on 83 Yemenis, men, women, and children. And the director of the film, William Fredkin, stated that he saw audiences across the United States stand up and applaud this. You see, over a long period of time, a steady stream of bigoted images tarnishes our judgment and sensitivity of people and their culture. It dehumanizes Arabs and Muslims across the world, which carries over into our reality. Cinematic history tells us the stories of how Arabs and Muslims were perceived, but why? Why us? Why when only 12% of the world's Muslims are actually Arab? But you wouldn't know this. You wouldn't know this because of what is displayed on your TV screens in front of you. So again, I ask you, why? Why is this important? Why does this all matter? Xenophobia. Xenophobia derives from Greek terminology. It is the intense or irrational dislike or fear of people from other countries. But what xenophobia forewarned us about is that when one ethnic or racial or a religious group is vilified, innocent people suffer. And the fact is, innocent people have already suffered. According to Arab Studies Quarterly, after the attacks of September 11th, 1,200 Muslims were arrested and detained, and none of them were found to have any links with terrorism. None. The FBI reported that in the months following the 9-11 attacks, hate crimes against Muslims increased by 1,600%. 1,600%. And as of 2015, hate crimes against Muslims are five times more common than they were before 9-11. And unfortunately, in 2015, innocent people did suffer. And I dedicated my capstone to the three victims that were murdered in the Chapel Hill shooting in North Carolina. Dear Barakat, he was 23. He was in his second year as a dental student at the University of North Carolina. He worked to raise money in hopes of providing dental care for Syrian refugees. And a month before he was married, uh, murdered, he married his wife, Yusar Abu Salha. She was 21, and she had just been accepted into the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill Dental Program. And she had a little sister, Rezan. Rezan Abu Salha, she was 19 years old. She was a very talented artist, and she was, as well, a student at the University of North Carolina. All three of them died because of their faith. Because of the representations Arabs and Muslims are constantly depicted as. You see, it's up to us, us as Americans and as human beings, to not forget incidents like this. This is why we fight for civil rights. This is why we fight for, this is why we stand up against anti-Islamic rhetoric and why we point out the stereotypes and why we point out the misrepresentations. Because sometimes the consequences can be too much to bear. But that is why I also believe combating Islamophobia is possible. Because I don't want Diaz, Yusuf, and Rezan's death to go in vain. I don't. But it begins with programs like diversity peer educators that we actually have here at Georgia College. Diversity Peer Educators, DPE, is a group of student leaders dedicated to facilitating conversations among the student body about various issues of diversity. But DPE is not only offered here, but it's offered across universities all over the nation. So educating people and yourselves about Islam and who Muslims are is vital to our society. And that is why I praise organizations like Jesus and the Quran. Jesus in the Quran is a Christian-based organization that not only offers information and stories about Islam and who Muslims are, but travels the nations combating Islamophobia. They were just in Atlanta at the end of October. And this is why I urge you to educate. Educate yourselves. Learn. Teach people about not only what Islam is and what Islamophobia is, but about diversity. 
Because at the end of the day, diversity is what makes America so great. Thank you.